Hutcherson. For those of you who are familiar with Local Bias, you are probably aware that we've been on hiatus for a couple of years. Well, we're back in the studio for a limited run this summer, and my first guest is an old friend of Greenfield Community Television and of WMCB, Western Massachusetts Community Broadcasting, 107.9 LPFM in Greenfield, Paul Richmond. Um, Paul, you have a radio show on Wednesdays. Is it at noon? Uh, one o'clock. One o'clock, okay. It's called Imagine. It was started by Tom McLean. That's who, right. Who was one of the founders of WMCB. Oh, wow. And uh, in fact, he had, the long, he had the very first program. So your show is the longest continuously run program on WMCB. And I just want to personally express my gratitude to you for keeping it going. Um, it's hard to know with community radio sometimes how much impact it really has. But I know that I've, there have been times I've sat in the car and I've listened, and I've enjoyed it. So, oh, thanks. So there you go for that. Yep. But there's something else that you do that a much wider audience is aware of. And I'm not talking about your juggling, though that is exemplary. I'm talking about your poetry and the music that you've been doing with Tony Vaca and John Sheldon and Avery Sharp and Derek Jordan and a cat, just the best musicians in the Valley. How did all that even happen? That's a good question. I wish I knew. <laughs> well, I mean, did you, so did you know Tony first? Or did well, you... let's just say, real quickly, I came to the Valley in 79, yeah. and uh, basically Tony Vaca was here. A lot of people, I think, were told or drawn here. I was brought here by a guitarist, Elliot Sharp, who later went to New York and went off to Europe because at first everybody came here because this was going to be the artist haven, they thought. Right. Uh, and that's when uh, the Iron Horse was just one storefront. They right. hadn't expanded. And they had a, a poster on the wall that said, let the arts live. Though most of the artists were like, well, how about the artists? Right. Um, but anyways, there was the, and there were studio spaces. The rents weren't that high in Northampton. I went to a lot of people's second floor studios. Artists were performing. And it was the vibe that you thought, okay, we're all here. And we were all beginning. Right. So I didn't hang out with Tony or anything like that or John for all those years necessarily. But, you know, when you're on the circuit of you being a performer, who's yeah, as an artist, or you end up at the festivals and they're playing and you're doing something, you know, so everybody, you're on circuits right. because you're an artist and so you run and some people you might get closer to and some you don't. And, but over the years, um, I kept running into John and I kept running into Tony and then Tony came to one of my word festivals because he actually works, he has his own well, he, spoken word right. stuff. That's right. And he showed up a couple times and then one time I encouraged him, I said, hey, Tony, just go up without any of your stuff. He said, well, I feel naked. Uh, and I said, yeah, well, just go up, you know, as you, because you've got words, your words are strong, you know, just see what, how that goes, you know. And he got real excited about that. He got a little freaked out because I think the first person who went up before him, you know, did a killer thing. And he goes, geez, I got to follow that. And I said, yeah. And I'm, I'm sure he did great, though. Oh, yeah, he did. He's, he's got some great stuff. And, well, his, and he, he, so Tony, what I get from him, he has so much soul. He cares so much. He's full of love, full of expanse. He wants to reach out and bring everybody together. And it comes through. I mean, it's a beautiful soul. So it's inspired. He's inspirational. Yes. In fact, and John Sheldon. Same thing. Yeah. So I, I was at a show one time. John was playing at the Green River Cafe, where the People's oh, wow. Pint is now. Okay, yeah. There was a snowstorm. It was like in December or something. And so it was myself and one other person in the audience. <laughs> and he put on an amazing performance. He didn't hold back anything. It was a solo show. Blew my mind. And the thing is, he could have said, you know, there's no one here. Let's just... But He's such a professional. Yeah, that's one really great thing. The recent show we had at uh, the, comp, the park in Turner's Falls, uh, a number of things happened, and we're not getting too many details, but it was one of those where you're glad you're with professionals because you go, yeah, we've all experienced it. The cord suddenly doesn't work. It worked yesterday. Right. Oh, this doesn't go, that doesn't. 
the audience is here. We're on. That's right. Uh, w w plan Z. Exactly. 24, actually. Right. Uh, and you jump in and go, and you're not complaining, you're not going on and on, and you've got enough in your um, bag of tricks to go, okay, you know, that's gone, uh, this one I can still do, and boom. And, you know, and, and, and also they're real listeners. I mean, no, you can get into, and you might have, you've had, to, because of being yourself being an artist or playing with people, run into, oh, okay, this person's going to hog the show. Right. Okay, wait a minute, I'm over here, do you, do you, I'm supposed to play now. Are you going to let me in? You're not right. going to let me in? What's happening? Uh, th those guys, they all know they could run, be the whole show. That's right. I mean, it's, it's not a question of can they be the whole They are, they could be the whole show. One of the things they understand, and, it's about the music and it's about the whole experience. It's about, it's not everybody. about their performance. It's about everybody. It's about everybody. That's and right. what they really, uh, I called each of them at some point, and what they liked about the concept was, and I specifically at the first said, I know you have a lot of projects. I'm not asking you to be my project and only my project. I'm asking you if you can fit in when I want to do my project, would you like to try something? Right. And what I was offering to them was something that they weren't necessarily doing of, well, what are you going to do? I don't know, show up. Um, I, you've got what you got and you got what you, and what I want us to do is just listen to each other and I've got some stuff and let's see what happens. So, when, so th as far as the written material that goes with the music, I have it, but it never. Um, music changes written material. Right. Written. I mean, I've been the pacing in any, of how you pacing, deliver. How much I can say. Oh, what they're playing. It's really only a three-line delivery because they're. It's that the beat isn't there. But we didn't because we didn't set it. I mean, if we were doing a song, somebody could say, "Oh, we need to give this you four spaces," right. and I could get the fourth line in. Since we haven't had that conversation, I'm listening, and I, oh no, they're going. Okay, so I'm not going to do that line. Uh, oh, it's a oh, I could get the line there. Okay, that's interesting. That changes the whole dynamic of what I was going to say because that line was announced by itself. Um, and sometimes I found, oh, I didn't do the last three stanzas because they were going or going. I think, oh, they're ending. Oh, wow. Okay. Sometimes I could feel disappointed, like. Oh man, as a writer, those were the killer lines, you know. Right, right. <laughs> and then you'd go out into the audience, and people would tell you what the piece was about, and you go, "Okay, they got it anyways." Right. So, what was that? You know, because of the presence. I, actually, I, I have a feeling. Of, uh, I studied with a guy when I was doing my juggling, who was an amazing director, and he had us do some things. He was a credible mime. He was on the level of Marceau. He was like the American Marceau. He studied with Marceau in France, all this stuff. But he had this exercise that he would have you come out. And the rest of the students were the audience, and he would come over and whisper to you and say, uh, Drew, you're just coming out of the forest and you're seeing the ocean for the first time, okay? No reaction. I don't want you to do facial expressions. I don't want you to do anything. I want you to stand here and internalize that, okay? And then after a period of time, people would, he would say, where is he? And people would go, mm, he's outside. And, and after a while, you could say it was 50-50 questions, possibly, that you know you could go either way. But after a while, they would get to a point where you would, and he would say, this is what real good performers do. You have the premise inside you. You're holding that premise. So the audience doesn't so, know that's the premise. The premise, yet, premise. But when I go to move my hand, that premise is directing that I'm moving my hand to push the elevator button, and you know I'm in an elevator. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, I, I'm not moving my hand to do, oh, I'm moving my hand because I'm fly fishing. Okay, well, right. now you've got or I'm, that, phone. Phone or whatever, <laughs> but you, the premise is there enough that it's, it's reaching to, because you are directing us in, in your whole being of presence. So do you understand that you have that? But the audience is part of the performance. They're watching, you're there. Well, it also gives you incredible stage presence. When I, one thing I noticed that I had on other writers, and it wasn't about being better or anything, is that most writers stay in their rooms by themselves writing. Being on stage, as you know, is a di you can be at home playing your congas right. as much as you want and think you're fabulous and right. then get on stage. And I embarrass and, myself. And, or, or just realize, <laughs> oh, I have to deal with other things. It doesn't matter that I have all these great riffs. Right. People don't like how I'm looking at them, or I don't know how to look at them. Oh, or I don't know how to step back I, when somebody else is stepping up. Or whatever, all kinds of things. Yeah. Um, and so when I would start to, and I had the kind of information that as a juggler, nobody goes 
Paul, oh, would you like to perform at our event? <laughs> <laughs> what? Are you kidding? Every event needs a juggler. Uh, yeah. Uh, you're, you're calling, you're sending mail. This is all before the internet. You're doing stuff. You're on. You know, so writers aren't used to doing that. They, the old premise was, you know, the publisher would show up and do, we heard about your great writing. We're going to publish you, you know. Right. Uh, and, like, that doesn't really happen. No. Um, but that was the illusion or delusion. And so, unfortunately, they're very quiet people. So when they got up to the mic, it was like, oh, well. and I don't know how many writers I saw. You know, the first person was short. The mic's here. And, oh, my God, I've and seen that. And they're just kind of like, eh, so nobody can hear you. Right. So you're not really getting that you're, everyone wanted to buy your book, but because nobody can hear you, nobody likes what you're saying or can't right. appreciate it. And you're afraid to just go, eat, eat, Because eat, you don't eat. have that experience. You don't know how, or right. you're worried, or it makes noise, or you go to touch it and falls down, and then you're embarrassed. And, and so sometimes <laughs> if people would see me go to, because when I went to Austin, there was a, you could hit like 10, 12 stages at a time. So I hit them all because I was going there to test material, and I wanted to see. Nobody knows me. I've got this piece. I'm going to do it eight times. This audience. And tweak it a little bit as you get reactions. Watching, seeing, why, okay, I'm going to stop with that. Why are they giving me a standing ovation? Why are they giving me the finger on this one? What, you know, what, what, what happened? Oh, well, okay, now I get all, yeah, because they didn't like that. Well, that's okay. A group, I mean, it's, there's so, so many be, factors. Right. You, but know, you have I mean, to be very self-critical, though. That is, you have to be able to step out and say, this is what's working, this isn't what's working. And with a lot of artists, they're so in love with their own material. I mean, writers have this issue where they need editors to say, no, you're too wordy. Yeah, but see, when I, by studying with Tony, he set up, any idea is fine. I'm not going to judge you on your idea. Like, I think I might have mentioned that story that he said, you know, you came and you want to do a cow driving a car, you know, and then he would say, I don't want you coming out here going, moo, moo. Okay, that's, uh, no. You know, I, you come out, do something, and we'll experience cow driving a car. So now what I'm going to do as a director and what we're going to do as the audience in the class, you came out, we don't, I didn't get an animal, I didn't get a car, I don't know, what, what, what are you doing? You're traveling maybe, go back up to the studio. No, no, no putting you down, come back, okay, we got, you're in a vehicle, we don't know who's driving yet. Go back to the studio, no, 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 no. you got the guy, uh, somebody, uh, okay, cow, we got, we're getting cow. And the thing is, you had to do all that work but you were receiving the guidance from somebody. You're that... getting the feedback. I thought doing this right. was that. You're right. not, I'm thinking it does that. You're telling me you're not reading that. Right. So, okay, nobody's wrong. Right. I, I, I thought that was what I, right. I mean, That's we have that in our regular lives. Sure. I say something to you, I think, I think my that... intention was this, and you're suddenly yelling at me because I put you down, or it was right. like, that wasn't my intention. Okay, but, oh, I could see maybe later how it was. Or, right. Um, but that's a great gift to be able to, offer criticism in a way that is not judgmental because people are so insecure about their own, you know, the perception of what people have of their, of who they are. Yeah. And they want people to, you know, you, they, you want, when you get up there and you read, and you read your poetry, you want to reach them. You want to move them. You want to get them to think about something. And if they, and if they go, oh, that's awful. I can't stand that. I mean, that's to not have that affect you takes a bit, you know, you a certain maturity, I suppose. Yeah, I'm, well, I mean, it, it's a craft. See, we go back to, are you, are you doing your craft to improve? Right. And do you do something, and you're not looking at it as, you know, schools have wrecked a lot of things. Mm -hmm. I, I was trying to do this piece about, excuse me, this performing arts school that was really destroying arts, really. And so why, what a weird Orwellian mm -hmm. saving the art, you know, the arts in the school, and they're not doing that. Because uh, we're being told what is art, and we're telling what is good art, and we're telling how to do it, and we're not allowing the, realizing how many things happen out of mistakes. Right. And how many things happen because, oh, if I wouldn't have done that, and that paint didn't spill onto that, oh, look at that, that merges. Oh, I could use that to merge this. And so it's, it's more that we've lost in education the um, trusting experiential learning. Mm -hmm. Most people don't know even what experiential learning is. You could say graphic thing is, oh my God, that's hot. Okay, uh, okay, that's hot. Okay, so how many times do you need to do that? Do you need to bring in an expert? Right. Do I finally, right. because you say to me, that's hot. Oh, okay, I won't touch that. You didn't trust yourself to know that that was hot, and why don't you trust yourself to know that? Because you don't, and so if you don't have that trust, you can't go up, are you, well, that's the other part. I mean, I learned from him to come up and I'm looking at the audience. 
I'm not going to be scared. Right. I then don't get on the stage. Yeah. You're I mean, supposed if, to be there. If, if, if I, well, his thing was if I wanted to put myself on that stage, then people are going to look at you. Right. So example is one of a really funny exercise he had was another one. Go up. I don't want you to do anything. I want you to be here with the audience for two minutes. I'll let you know when two minutes are up. People would go up and they said, oh, I sorry, I got, and, and no talking. You know, suddenly they're in their hands. Women were suddenly covering themselves and, and, and some of the people were backing up and all of a sudden they hit the back wall. They want out, you know, let me get out of here. And so then he would say, well, what's going on? Well, you're all looking at me or, you know, I can't, oh, all your insecurities are coming up because people are looking at you. You don't have to go up on a stage, but you came here to study to be on a stage. Well, and that's, I find that so fascinating, Paul, because there are so many artists I know who, are, who have stage fright. Now, as a percussionist, I've been playing long enough that I don't think I ever get stage fright on playing percussion. But I've been taking bass lessons now for a few years. I practice my scales all the time. I'm, I'm no longer a novice. I'm terrified of getting on stage. And I, and I haven't done it yet. I mean, I've been avoiding it. So what is it? What, well, one thing is, I read this great book a long time ago out of the 50s. Some guy went around and interviewed people that some people won't know anymore, but Bob Hope, all these people who said, <laughs> okay, you're, you're famous. You probably don't have stage fright anymore, right? Bob Hope. Uh, yeah, okay. and uh, the, the big names. Right. Just, okay. just think any big sure. names. He went, men and women, he wanted to figure out, did they, you get over it, obviously, right? right? And all of them were, no, no, no. And what the ones who were successful started to understand their bodies. Oh, my hands are starting to sweat. Okay, so, oh, I have to throw up. Okay, so in my contract, I need a bucket by the stage. Paul Richmond, hi, here we go. And, and not spend time being down on myself that, oh, now I have to take a piss or now I have to do this. No, that's my body telling me, you're going out in front of 5,000 people. Yeah, I'm gearing up. Okay. I mean, there's people out there. Well, I know. And, I've and, heard and, this. And I'm going to do something, and they may go, boo. It doesn't matter that I'm famous. I don't know. Nobody gets it that yesterday I was famous. Today, they, is this still What have you done to me thing? lately? <laughs> yeah. Is this going to be what? And so they were like saying, if, if you spent all your time before they announced you, I don't I hate myself. I don't want this to be happening. You're not preparing for what's going to be your first line. Right. If you've let all that go and go, yeah, of course my hands. Are, yeah, of course my stomach's doing it, you know, and that's why I have a little yogurt, and okay, I'm good, and meanwhile, oh, no, I'm not going to say that line, oh, I hear what he's, okay, I'm, I'm ready, boom, then you're coming on differently. Right. And so I found that interesting, because it was like, okay, stop trying to make something stop. It's not stopping, and you're not bad because it's not stopping. It's not stopping. You're, this is your body. Your body tells you in this way, you have to pee every 10 seconds. Okay, well, finally that happens. Okay, or whatever it is. Right. The other part was that he... And one of his key lines was, if you don't see the audience, the audience doesn't see you. So when you get up there, and I've noticed, when sometimes I was juggling, I was realizing, oh, I'm losing the audience. Or even with poetry, I would just stop and just kind of slowly let and, and people would be there. And, kind of, and all of a sudden, everyone boom, and you could feel it. All of a sudden, the room was, boom. Something oh, changed. What's going the, on? The room's here. And then you could go, and eh, we're going to try to take it again. And so he was constantly with saying to you, you know, present. It's like almost Buddhism. I mean, it's, it's right. a lot of different things. Are you in the moment? Are you willing to accept the moment? Are you watching what's happening in the moment? Are you, what's, and so being at word festivals, sometimes people would be up at the mic, people get up, I get up on the mic, also the mirror, I get off the mic, how'd you get the room to do that? And I was like, well, I wanted to present. So I got up and I could tell they're not, and so I'm gonna fix the mic. They're waiting, they're wondering, are you going to do, oh, okay, and went, no, I'm ready, I might say something, I'm in. You, you understand know? room psychology, really, is what it is. I'm accepting that I'm going up to perform. Right. And I, I have a certain responsibility. And I'm doing it because I'm, I'm doing it from an old tradition of honoring the audience that they were expecting something from me. And I want to give them the gift of whatever right. I have to offer. Maybe they'll say, I don't want your gift or whatever, that's okay, and I can't take that on. I have to accept what I, my intentions were. If I'm there to have you like me, mm -hmm. then I got a lot of different problems, because if you don't like me. But you're like not me, there for that. You're there because you have a message. Oh, don't get me wrong, it's nice when well, people like me. Well, it is nice, but, <laughs> but, 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 yeah, but yeah, I'm overall, I, I, I have things I want to say, or I, I feel like, well, this last performance I just did, people came up endlessly, thank you, 
for saying what's not being said. Right. Thank you for acknowledging what I think in my head. Thank you for on and on about that kind of thing so that because the rest of the world, as you and I were talking before this started, you know, there's a lot of side, uh, side narratives that the media puts out that then you go, wait a minute, which, like say example, oh, can you give water to people who are standing in line for 12 hours? Oh. It's like, wait a minute, so I'm gonna argue about giving water or am I gonna argue about why is anybody standing in line in a democracy for that and why moment. isn't the bigger uh, amphitheaters open so the voting can happen and nobody's waiting? So uh, that's the issue, not the water. How did you get me over here to argue and then, oh, you're, I'm going to make it look like I won so I can hand people water and they're still standing in line for 12 hours? Right. Uh, that's not actually, no, we got, we got, we got diverted. You know? Right. So I think trying to state those things, and as you mentioned, we try to state that on our, the radio show too, but it's tough because people want good news or they want happy things. Or let's talk about puppies. Well, they say they want that, but they tune into all the, you know, if it bleeds, it leads. <laughs> So they I, say they want I, happy news, but if I you guess. had a happy newspaper, nobody would read it. Well, yeah, like Yes Magazine, you know, without plugging, the, I, they didn't make it. I mean, <laughs> right, everybody, <laughs> everybody was like thinking, okay, we need that magazine, and then there's too much good news in there or it's something. It's like people I saying, they, oh, I don't eat sugar. It's like, and then they're out eating sugar. Yeah, it's I humans. don't know. Uh, the other thing, I, I, just to go back a little bit, it was interesting to, um, I, I think what you're talking about is there's, when you have an art form, is your art form for you? is your art form because you want to offer it and you think it gives people something? And then does your art form have a public aspect to it? Right. Because, a, and this happened to a writer that I knew, he was, everybody loved his books, wanted to buy his books. He died every time he went on the stage. Literally, people almost didn't recognize that he was the author they liked. Wow. And a couple of times, and I met him once, and he asked me and three other people to read his poems say they were his poems, and he wanted to watch the reaction. After he saw us and what happened, he told the organizers, I'm not coming back to read anymore. These people have skills, and I'm not interested in getting those skills. Right. And it's it a, is a skill. It, it's a different skill set. I want to just be in my room writing, and if they want to talk to me while I'm signing books, I can do that. <laughs> so, but, but being... But, Dealing with the microphone, talking, making that dynamic or whatever, that's, it is different. Well, so, and that's part of what you, you, you you're like a five tool player because you write your material, you even publish it, you have your own publishing company, Human Error Publishing, mm -hmm. uh, but also there's the performance aspect where, aspect where you have to learn the craft. You have to understand pacing, dynamics, bring it up, bringing it up, the, the twist or whatever it is to, to, to grab people's attention or to get them to go, oh, I hadn't looked at it that way. And you have to work all of that into every single thing that you write. Yeah. So what is your writing method? Do you like get up in the morning and start writing? Do you have a, like a discipline that you follow? Yeah, I guess actually I would I want to back up just a little bit. Sure. I, I think, no, because it's all related. It, it's, so how did I end up with that skill set? I didn't plan on that. It was just from being a professional. Well, no, I mean, it's, in life, you know, you go down and this door opens and you go, I mean, I learned how I was, you know, I was a person who was either on the bench or in right field and we hope they don't hit to them. Okay. Yeah. I, and so then basically I'm in a friend's studio later in college. He has little paint things and I'm kind of playing with them. And suddenly I, I threw the X, which is what you need to juggle. Right. And I realized it wasn't a pat and I was like, okay, what happened? What was that? Because nobody was teaching me. I was just there playing and it fell into it. And then I realized, oh, there's the space. Oh, uh, oh that's tiny... why you can, that's how you get three in, okay? So then, okay, I'm not planning on being a juggler. I just learned that. Oh, I get a couple balls because it's exciting to me. So, okay, I'll juggle. All of a sudden I'm juggling kind of the part. All of a sudden some guy goes, oh, do you know how to do? And did you do, do, do? Right. oh, okay. Then I move here. And the year I move here, the International Juggling Association decides to have its festival at Hampshire College in 1979. Okay, did I plan that? Did I know that would change my life completely by walking into a room of 800 people throwing things at themselves? And that there were people who made props? And that there were, oh, people are saying they have jobs at it. So are these things, and, so is this meant to happen? I often wonder about that. Yeah, you wonder about, you know, well, I, I, one, a, a couple things. I, I think that uh, if you don't make space for it, things don't happen. Nature abhors a vacuum. So 
I was brought up in Buffalo. My before the steel plants left, everybody assumed you're working for the steel plants, either Republic or Bethlehem, or some subsidiary that does stuff for those. Things. Right. So anytime you were attempting to go to college or do some, just go get your job. Right. I mean, what do you? What's that's not actually Greenfield was like that. We used to have the best tie, tap and die companies in the world. So there's no, there, there was no, you and I were joking before, the, the guidance counselor's not saying, Drew, do you want to play congas or right. do you want to do something? That wasn't even in a list no. of things to t discuss right. or other aspects. And if you were lucky, maybe it wasn't before they went to arts with the, the art teacher going from one school to another with a box, that there was an art classroom and that the art teacher could really do art and you had it every day like you had other subjects or whatever it might be or once a week something that was happening um, so that part is kind of uh, you know with that gone you're not having that experience you're not thinking that that's there um, I sort of feel like I made moves of trusting myself that I don't want to go do that so I'm gonna try I don't know I'm, I'm now in the unknown okay what does that mean I don't know oh, okay well this is leading me here oh okay I moved when I moved back from college I didn't move from with my parents back they were upset about all that oh I'm a hippie oh I'm moving into a black area oh I'm being called the new nigger because hippies are being beat up and okay the black folks who live there were like well maybe you'll get beat up before us <laughs> so okay right. you can live here or something right and then you know that changed and oh now long hairs are pulling badges out Oh, okay. So that's changed. Cause now, so now infiltration. So we don't have a we don't have a club anymore. Cause you can't. Right. Before I meet you in the road. Oh, I knew I could sleep on your couch or I don't know something. You know, because we were in the tribe. Right. Then also, no, no, we don't have a tribe. And just like you know, the punks went through that. Everybody went through that. How quickly Wall Street's wearing. You know, everything Mohawks. gets co-opted. Yeah, right? really fast. So you're trying to figure out who you are and what interests you and where you go with that. And then once you step out. Are you locked in by that group says you can only look like this or dress like this or you suddenly don't look like this you don't dress like that you notice how um, all the non-conformists look alike yeah everybody looks everybody looks alike I mean, yeah, it's, I mean, and then it's really hard because you go i mean i at one point i tried to go okay because i almost got beat up at a clash concert of a bunch of punks telling me the hippies were dead right and so it's kind of like okay uh and then it was kind of like okay what images do you want and now you know that i was i've been not, i was nominated the beat poet laureate then everybody's like, oh, so you're beats. You, so you're in the, and now I'm running into a whole bunch of the old beat writers who are still alive, and many of them said they shunned the title of or the being called beat because of all the drugs and sexual, uh, you know, William Burroughs, what got advertised was not as, the actual. As, as, as it was, was much broader than those stereotypes of that. Well, I would and love to have a conversation about that, but we've already run out of time, Paul. We have? We have. That was the half hour? That was half an hour. I mean, I didn't by. even really get to good stuff. Uh, so you're gonna have to come? Well, you know what, let's, <laughs> let's, let's, meet, let's meet again. Uh, there, like I say, every time I talk to you, there's just so much. But So we'll have to do this again later, is that all right? All right, that's all cool. Yep. All right, well, thank you so much for coming on. I really appreciate yeah. it. I'm Drew Hutchison. You've been tuned to Local Bias. My guest has been Paul Richmond. Thank you for joining us. Take care. This could be a teachable moment, but maybe not. I walked into a cafe, and they said, we don't serve people like you. And so I thought, oh, this could be a teachable moment. I wasn't planning on going to the hospital. I had some other plans that day. I was told they didn't like my kind. And when I picked up the table, I had thought of throwing it through the front window. But then I thought that would be a drag for the people who were sitting at the window. So instead, I threw it at the guy coming at me with a baseball bat. which meant I was defending myself, but that seemed to enrage them even more. I had actually heard that their coffee sucked, 
I had thought, well, maybe sucky coffee over no coffee was a better choice. This turned out to be a teachable moment. I now have a different perspective. I think it's okay to go without coffee. <laughs>